imagine you wanted the world's best GT car. Your choices until recently may have come from Bentley or Aston Martin, but now it also includes perhaps the most evocative automotive brand on the planet. It's the new Ferrari Roma, but is it a choice over an Aston DB11 or a Bentley Continental GT? Okay, welcome to the interior of the Continental GT. And of these three cars, if you want luxury, this is the place to be. And it's primarily because of the material quality. The stitching on here is lovely. And you, you don't have to have this light cyan metallic blue, which looks a little bit like the colors you might paint a dodgem. You can have metal or you can have wood or you can have whatever you like to make it a bit more discreet. Now, there's a reason I have not turned it on yet. And that reason is because Look, luxury means, I don't know if you can see that, I actually get my seatbelt presented to me rather than just me having to reach around. That is that is what this, this car is about. It does things for you, so you don't have to do them yourself. This screen flips around, but you don't have to have it on. You can have the full, ooh, radio too. You can have the full touch screen or you can just flip it around. And if you want totally luxury, I want to do nothing. I want to be undisturbed. You just have those little dials ticking away in the background. There are a lot of switches in here and I am okay with that. There is quite a lot to do on the touch screen, but there are quite a lot of physical buttons. And once upon a time you'd have said, oh no, that's a bit, that's a bit naff. But actually compared to using a touch screen, it's so much easier to have proper actual physical buttons, especially when they're as nicely finished as most of the stuff is. All right, some of the scattered stuff on here doesn't look great, but actually in terms of material quality and feel, things like these organ stop air vents and the knurling on here, it's all really exquisitely, really lovely. This feels like the most luxurious car of the three. Okay, so the Bentley has the most luxurious interior, no question, but does that translate to the way that it drives? Well, yes, in short is the answer. This is a big car, it's a wide car, it weighs 2100 kilos plus, partly because it's got all of this stuff inside it. The engine is inaudible unless you really want it to be. This is Bentley's twin turbo V8 if you don't want it to be. It does make a nice sort of really bellowy, bassy V8 noise, but most of the time it's kind of inaudible. It drives through a twin clutch gearbox, which is sort of unusual for a luxury oriented car, but because Bentley is part of the Volkswagen group and Volkswagen wants to use this platform and this drivetrain elsewhere, with a twin clutch gearbox for greater response, it means Bentley has to use it too. They've chewed it pretty hard to try and make it as smooth as they can. And most of the time, it is good. It is, it is really smooth. It's not as responsive as you would expect a twin clutch to be, and maybe that's because it's been tuned for more luxury, but sometimes you ask for a shift, you don't quite get it. You don't quite get it straight away. This is a big car, it occupies a lot of road, and it kind of feels it as well. And as you go over crests and bumps, there is a bit of float, there is a bit of, you know, you do, there is this sort of, oof, it takes a second to settle as you go over crests and bumps. You can whack the suspension, thanks to here, into a sport mode, which really does firm things up on tight, twisty roads like this. But you're always aware, even though this car is lighter than Bentley's W12, which has an extra, I don't know, 100 kilos in the nose, maybe. You are aware this is a big car. It gets, it takes some effort to get it turned, but that effort is not without reward. There is lots of traction. There is lots of grip. Steering's really nice. It's very smooth. It's very linear. It just sort of takes up a little bit of weight and feel just off sort of straight ahead in this kind of very natural feeling way. And the balance of uh, power front to rear is generally in normal driving pushed well towards the back. So as you accelerate out of bends, the software starts to put power to the front because it thinks, okay, you may want a bit of extra traction, stuff like that. So this is never a car that feels really rear driven, even though most of the time it is. It just feels very planted, very solid, very refined. It's certainly at the upper end of the luxury when it comes to luxury GT behavior. And that's probably really appropriate for this car. Bentley is a Bentley. 
It's difficult to dislike it for that, isn't it, really? I've had an awful lot of time for this car. I like it a great deal. But whether it gets that blend of GT luxury sport, it certainly sits at the, at the luxury end of that scale. And whether that's the most likable thing for a GT, well, we'll have to try the others and see how they come out. And so to the Aston Martin DB11, whose interior is a bit of a mixed bag. Let's start with what's good. I like the driving position. The driving position is strong. I don't like the steering wheel, but I said I'll just concentrate on the things that I like for the moment. Driving position is sound. It's quite a cocoonish, cockpity style interior. And I am also quite a fan of having the gear selectors up here. I know not everybody is, but what it means is it frees up space down here and you can have this armrest as far back or as far forward as you like which is quite cool leaves this big storage cubby here and leaves room for a controller for the infotainment system right here and most of the materials are pretty good you get this kind of chopped carbon which i'm quite a fan of the stitching is nice the leather is good that's what's good there are some bits that are not quite so hot and primarily they are a two or three generation old mercedes infotainment system which is just really slow. I like the fact that it's controlled with a proper controller rather than being all touchscreen, but it's just lacking some of the some of the stuff that you would that you would like, some of the iPhone integration and stuff like that. Things that you might realistically want, it does not have. There is also no excuse for the style of plastic in these air vents. It's just it's it's not good enough. And you may be too young to remember the Sinclair ZX Spectrum of 1982, but I am not. And it introduced me to the colours cyan and magenta. And they're kind of replicated in these dials here, which is really low, shonky resolution. Not as low as a ZX Spectrum. It's maybe Commodore 64 quality. And that's really poor at this sort of money. And it's kind of in, it kind of indicates the amount of money that a company like Aston had to blow on this sort of thing. They are not part of a massive multinational global corporate empire. And I think when it comes to some of this stuff, it really shows. So it is gonna to have to make up ground on the road. So with this interior, the Aston has got a little bit of work to do to really sort of impress as a GT car. And immediately, if you come out of the Bentley and you sit in this, you can feel that the ride is less isolated. There's more connection with the road. That's not necessarily a bad thing if you get more dynamism with it because a GT, by its definition of Grand Tourer, has to have a combination of the two, sort of luxury and sports together. It just depends where you want to sit on that slope as to whether this or the Bentley is the, the preferable car. I feel like I'm talking louder. It feels like a noisier car. I think there's more wind, there's more road noise but there's certainly a greater connection between me and the road beneath me. This is strictly rear wheel drive. It drives through a conventional eight speed auto. This is the AMR version of the DB11, which means as a 5.2 liter twin turbocharged V12 rather than the DB11's V8. That puts a bit more weight in the nose, but this is still a lighter feeling and more agile car than that Bentley. It's got a really nice blend, I think, of ride and handling for a GT car. Really nice blend. If you want to change the ride handling balance of things, it's one click on here, puts it into uh, sport mode in, on the dampers, and then you can put them in sport plus. It does make a difference on a little road like this. You could do the same to the powertrain, you put it in Sport and then Sport Plus, which turns up the engine note and also the exhaust pops. I mean, they might be a bit contrived, but I don't care. It does sound mega. This engine is a serious piece of kit. <laughs> and when you've got the suspension turned up into a firmer mode, as you go over crests and bumps, it doesn't sort of take quite so long to settle and it doesn't float quite so much over the top as the Bentley does, it just gets it all done in a sort of breath and a half rather than two breaths. 
and because this twin turbocharged V12 makes so much torque low down and it's only rear wheel driven, just has that ability as you come out of the corner, just wants to help it straighten its line in that really nice natural way that front engined rear wheel drive cars do with a long wheelbase. You can just trail the brakes into a corner to keep the weight on the nose and then just as you come back on the power it just pushes it straight. That's really lovely, that really, really lovely balance that I like in a GT car. You know, the traditional GT car is a long bonneted vehicle, very sleek, very elegant front engine rear wheel drive with a nice pleasing natural balance and this car is all of those things. Let's put it back into its GT-ish modes. One single pull on this big lever puts the gearbox back into drive and then if you just pull a paddle it puts it into manual and stays there. I really like that. I don't know why more cars don't don't have that. Sometimes you have to you know, you override it and then it overrides it for a short amount of time and then you have to really yank it this way and that way to put it in manual. This is really straightforward and I, I really, really like that way of doing things. But now it's back in its full GTS mode, the softest, most luxurious mode it has. No, it is not as isolated. No, it is not as cosseting. No, it's not as comfortable and it's certainly not as well finished as the Bentley. But I don't necessarily mind that. If you were taking a long motorway drive from here to Scotland, the Bentley would be better. This would be quite comfortable. The steering's nice and relaxed. It takes up weight. It's a good speed. It takes on a nice amount of weight as you turn. It's very natural. This would be fine over a really long distance. And then it would be more fun than the Bentley when you get to where you're going. On that scale of comfort versus dynamism, I prefer where this sits. And we've said this before, I think, actually, as well. I, this, this feels more like a GT Coupe, or do to me. The Bentley is a luxury car. This is a Grand Tourer. Where the Ferrari sits will be an interesting thing to see. Finally then, welcome to the interior of the Ferrari Roma, which is funky like no Ferrari ever before, and like neither of the other cars here as well. Material quality is not up to Bentley standards, but that is hardly a surprise, is it? And then things have changed from a Ferrari point of view. You used to get a big analog rev counter in the middle. That is now digital, and this entire display is digital, and all of the controls that were on the steering wheel in sort of big buttony form have now a lot of them have become these sort of haptic buttons, which is mostly fine, but I have, while cornering, hit this one here, which changes the view of that display panel entirely. But the driving controls, such as they are, the indicators, wipers and headlights remain on the steering wheel, and then all of the ancillaries have kind of disappeared onto this touchscreen. The passenger gets to choose some of them themselves too. Touchscreen is okay. It's looks a bit weird it feels a little bit plasticky but you at least have somewhere to rest your hand while you're doing it and actually it's not overburdened with functions which is quite cool so i like the style i like the design i like the idea of it what i am intrigued to see is how it all fits together and comes together while you're driving okay so welcome to the inside of the ferrari on the move and i can immediately tell you it's not as flat as either of the other two. It's being moved around and this steering is really sharp. This is a razor sharp car. If you are looking at the GT scale going from luxury through to sports, it takes about 50 yards to know. So, so quick to respond through there. It takes about 50 yards to know that this is well up the sports end of the scale. How comfortable is it? Well, my seats, my seats are not very good. You can mess around with them electronically through here and even if you back off the lumbar support and try and beef up the other sides they're kind of flat and unsupportive it's not not really sporty but also not really comfortable GT like but in terms of interior quibbles go I don't have much else having spent a little while in this interior I quite like this this thing I would prefer still I think a big analog rev counter because I just think it looks cooler than this one, but this is a really quite functional interior. And I've actually got used to this stuff on the steering wheel. 
very quickly. It's so razor sharp. It's just over two turns between locks, and the steering lock is actually quite quite good. So it's it's really it's really quick. But I think what's more, just as relevant as the speed of the rack is how quickly it responds to just even the tiniest inputs. Whereas in the Aston and the and the Bentley, if you as you turn, you sort of start to take up a bit of extra weight and a bit of response, and it feels quite natural in a way of trying to kid you that you're feeling, you know, the tyre build up a bit of force. As soon as you turn in this, it's just looking left and right. It's like meerkat head responsive. So it feels like you're sitting at the back rather than in the middle and it turning around you. It feels a little bit like it's turning in front of you, but there's no denying the front end has got loads of bite, loads of response. This is, I don't know, it feels more sports car than GT car. There are elements of sort of front-engined 488 or F8 Ferrari about it, rather than it just being a relaxed Grand Tourer. It is not as relaxing a car to drive. And when you find sort of truck grooves or poor services, it does sort of tram line a little bit in a way that certainly the Bentley doesn't. The Bentley's more stable, but you know, it's what you expect, isn't it? And this drivetrain is terrific. It's a is a twin clutch gearbox but it's massively responsive and yet still very smooth when it's just left to its own devices it's actually pretty good at maneuvering it's not quite as refined and straightforward as the other as the other two cars but you know you get a few more revs revs on as it just sort of poodles around but it's it's fine it's not a problem but this car really comes to life on roads where there are a lot of corners and a lot of inputs and you've got good visibility and you can press on a bit. I suspect it's a really good track car. I imagine it's the best track car here because it's so hyper responsive and agile and it weighs less than the other two and because of the way Ferrari tunes its engines, although this is a twin turbocharged car, peak torque doesn't come in till sort of three and a half thousand revs and yeah peak power is it like I don't know, just, just around, just under 6,000, something like that, and it revs to the other side of seven, but Ferrari likes its engines to feel linear. It doesn't feel like a hugely turbocharged, low-boosted car, whereas the Aston has peak torque from like 1,500 revs. You kind of have to work this a bit more, and I'm okay with that. So when it comes to picking a winner, I've got two colleagues with me here um, at the moment. I've asked them both which they would have, which is the best GT car, and which manufacturer did the best job at nailing the brief it set itself because those three questions are not all the same question which one would they have they both said they'd have the ferrari which one is the best grand tourer they both said the bentley and then i said well okay which manufacturer do you think did its job the best when it set out its brief in writing at the start of the project which manufacturer got it best done and they both said ferrari so your finishing order technically by by that very democratic objective set of purposes goes Ferrari wins Bentley second Aston Martin third it's not as simple as that with this test because these cars all do a slightly different thing whichever one you want will be the best car for you for me the kind of driving I do a mix of motorway back road I like noises I like a Grand Tourer that you know, you can trail break it. I like any car that you trail break in and then get back on the power and it sort of unsettles itself in that long bonnet front engine rear drive GT way. So the Aston for me is the car that I enjoy the most. This is too hyper for me. The Bentley is too inert and comfortable for me. The Aston gets it right for where I want a car to be. But I am in no doubt it is not the best car here. This is the best car here because dynamically it does astonishing things. It is really good and it's breathtakingly beautiful and it sounds good and I actually quite like the inside as well and the Bentley nails what Bentley thinks a luxury car should be it's a bit too soft for some of the GT purposes for me but there's no denying it's a cracking piece of kit but this is I am in no doubt a very sporty GT car and it's the best car here and I think even if you had one of the other two and you were comfortable in your own skin that you bought the right one, you'd look at one of these and think, maybe I should have, maybe I should have. And I don't think you'd necessarily get that if you bought this and saw the other two. So this car 
is number one. Are we right? Are we wrong? I don't think so. It seems fairly democratic. But if you think otherwise, drop a note down in the comments. And if you like this vid, we'd really love a like. And if you subscribe, you won't miss any of our other reviews, news, motor shows, when we get those again, group tests, will it drifts. We're here at least once a week. We're at autocar.co.uk all the time in news agents every Wednesday or there is a digital edition of the print magazine which has been published every week since 1895. And cheers for now, see you next time.